his uh, presentation comes out as one of the top few presentations of the summit. So, um, Amy, I am hoping you are there on Skype. I'm here. Waiting to chat. Excellent. Amy, over to you. And then uh, we'll hopefully have time for a few questions afterwards. So I shall hand over to you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And before I continue, can we just confirm that you can see, see me okay and see the presentation okay and hear okay? We can indeed. We can see the presentation. Terrific. So we're all good. Uh, well, okay. uh, I just wanted to say hello. And uh, firstly, I'm so sorry I cannot be there with you in person. Um, I, it's a combination of factors involving some travel that had been scheduled a year ago uh, and two broken ankles, uh, and I'm still recovering from surgery that I had a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this conference is extraordinarily, um, I think, impactful because there aren't very many places where the leaders of news organizations from all around the world have an opportunity to gather together, not just to talk about the business and the content side of news, but also to really think concretely about the future. So it is a real privilege to be able to speak with you today. Uh, I'm in, at home in my home office uh, uh, in Baltimore, which is one of the two places that I live. It's a real privilege. Um, and what I'd, my, my goal for us is to try to challenge your thinking as leaders, as people who make strategic decisions, but also to inspire you to confront deep uncertainty. So with that, I'd like to tell you a quick story um, that's almost 20 years old now. Uh, in the year 2001, I had a meeting with a group of newspaper publishers. And at that meeting, we were talking about the internet and websites and um, how to think about the future of publication and publishing. And at that meeting, I showed the publishers this phone. So this is... Uh, this was an early smartphone. It was called an iMode. Uh, I had been living in Japan at the time and was enthusiastic about a future in which distribution would be omnidirectional. And this phone did some pretty cool things. So it was connected to the internet. It also had a camera, as you can see. Um, it took photos. It uh, had music. It, most importantly, though, it allowed me to generate content uh, multimedia content and to send it around. Now, at the time, most of the world that had any kind of mobile device was using one of those earlier Nokia phones. Um, and the early Nokia phones had a fairly small screen. They basically just sent text back and forth and made phone calls. And there was a game called Snake that some of you may remember playing. And I understand that at that moment in time, uh, news organizations were grappling with the internet and mobile device smartphones seemed so far ahead that it, it almost seemed as though it was inconsequential. And I was trying to get them to see and to understand that this device, which I realize wasn't in the United States yet and probably wasn't gonna be, you know, we weren't gonna have anything like it for quite some time, but, but that in fact, it posed an existential risk. And the feedback that I got and the questions that I was asked um, had to do with ROI. So what exactly are, are you pitching us? What kind of project? And I explained, I'm not pitching you anything. I'm a researcher. I'm just trying to show you what's on your horizon. Uh, and I, I strongly recommend that you think about how this could impact your business model. Well, how much ad revenue are we really talking about? Uh, how much time is it going to take for us to, to do this research? How many staff? What's going to be the exact cost? All of these questions were tactical in nature. And the problem is you can't ask and answer tactical questions before you've thought through strategy and before you've done your visioning work and before you've thought about the much longer term evolution of the industry. And what wound up happening was a continual cycle of short term solutions to address longer term risk. So rather than thinking about uh, a mobile future. Instead, I witnessed news organizations sort of quarter by quarter trying just to catch up um, to where the internet was, was quickly headed. And I 
raise this story with you because um, this is not the first moment in time that you are grappling with deep uncertainty. Um, the industry has been in flux for several decades all around the world. Um, and, and what's next for news? What's on your horizon? All of these questions around uncertainty are not emanating from a single place. So it's not just about content itself. It's not just about technology or just about artificial intelligence or mobile or social. In fact, um, the uncertainty that you're grappling with stems from these 10 sources of disruption. And it's not just news. So, you know, most of my time is spent, as I mentioned, researching, but I build data-driven models for all different kinds of organizations across different industries. And as you're tracking the emergence of change and the change as it moves along a trajectory, it is influenced for the most part by these 10 sources of, of disruption, which means that when you are thinking about the future of news, uh, you also have to consider the future of news uh, as it relates to education and geopolitics and even things like infrastructure and public health. If you are not drastically expanding um, the, the scope and, and viewpoint that you have as you're thinking about the future, you will miss what's on the horizon. Um, and more to the point, you will fail to make the connection between a newfangled smartphone that doesn't seem like it's relevant especially given you have all these, you know, all these other issues to deal with, um, you won't make the connection between that and the work that you're going to be needing to do in the future. So you're facing a tremendous amount of deep uncertainty that is coming at you from every direction, whether that is um, the political cycle uh, in the United States and in the EU and, you know, changes that are happening throughout Asia. Um, or whether that's a shift in wealth distribution, which to some extent dictates when people have access to information and where. Um, you know, th there's a lot. There's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, and as a result, there's some question around what the future of news even looks like. I would argue that deep uncertainty warrants deep questions, not the kinds of questions that get us to the next quarter and to our budgets and to ROI, that stuff is important too. But you have to start asking deep questions about the evolution of the entire industry and your role in it. Like, how does the news business evolve in a digital era? And how does the editorial process adapt to very fast paced digital transformation? And perhaps most importantly, as a leader, what is it that you have to do and what does your organization have to do in order to succeed? These are deep questions that go far beyond the kind of strategic thinking that, in my observation, happens at most news organizations. And I recognize that everybody is in a, a difficult situation. Um, you know, I, I know that you're just trying to, to sort of get through the next quarter, few quarters, and to make things work. But if you continue along this cycle of short-termism, you're going to be worse off down the road. Now, there is a way to do this, um, and that is to think across different strategic time horizons simultaneously. So uh, what you see in front of you is the cone that I use um, as I'm mapping out the future. I don't use timelines because the future cannot be linear. Um, so rather, Instead, what we do is we say, well, at the present time, we have the most data that we're going to have. We've got evidence. We've got certainty. Therefore, we can make tactical decisions, and the actions that we can take are tactical. However, those must be done in service of strategic planning, and that's where you ask questions around budget and um, budget allocation and reorganization, standing up new units, business units or service units and the like. But all of that must be done in service of vision. What is your organization's, or you as a leader, your vision for what the future of news looks like in a concrete way? Now, I'm not talking about individual specific details, because the further out in the cone that we go, the less data and the less evidence and the less certainty we have, because we're talking about the farther future. But if you don't have a concrete vision of what news can look like in the wake of all of this disruption, then you're gonna get stuck 
over and over again just playing catch up. So you have to do your tactical work, your strategic planning in service of that vision. And that vision should fit into some concept of what your idea for disruption and evolution, not just for your organization, but the entire industry looks like. So you have to get into a habit of um, connecting the dots between these different time horizons, which stretch out over many, many years, but within each category have specific actions that can be taken. And if I go back to that mobile phone for just a moment, so you know, in the year 2001, I have this crazy phone from Japan that's not going to leave Japan for quite some time. And so, of course, you know, a news organization at that point, a publisher would have said, I can't, we, you know, our newsroom is, we're busy, we can't deal with this right now, we'll, we'll look at it later on. I would argue that the tactical work that could have happened in the year 2001 would have been to, you know, just do some research and have your editors do some research and, you know, the reporters and business side folks and HR people, the whole organization, just, you know, for the next month, we're all going to just sort of ambiently be thinking about this phone and phones like it. And then at the end of that, have a one hour meeting with everybody to talk through what could this mean? And then the basis of those that that work becomes part of your strategic planning going forward, which becomes part of the vision, which I would argue if all of this had been done, we would not currently be in a place right now where Facebook and Google, um, you know, and the other big tech players have eroded the, uh, the, the revenue model for news. So here's what I'd like to do uh, in, in the remaining 20 or so minutes that we have. Um, as you all know, um, in the research that my team and I do, we're constantly looking at emerging trends. And the point of this is to have um, a set of data uh, and a set of tools that we can use to model out future scenarios. Um, we're covering a lot of those at any given time. What I'd like to do is to address uncertainty head on with you. So I'm gonna talk about two different sort of chunks of trends um, that I believe are longer term threats to your organizations. And I, and I don't think you're looking at them critically enough. So I'm gonna go through two sets of trends that I believe are longer term threats. Um, and in the process of doing that, I'm going to ask you some deep questions. We're not gonna answer them because deep questions require investigation, but I at least wanna surface them because I wanna implant them uh, so that you continue to think about them over the coming months. Um, and then at the end, uh, after I ask you some deep questions, um, we're gonna stop and do sort of an ask me anything style Q&A um, and, and you ask me the questions that, that are on your mind. So the content and the trends that I'm going to show you come from our annual report. So this was released uh, two months ago, um, and it's the 12th edition of our annual report. Uh, this year, we're covering 315 tech trends ac across 26 different industries. Um, and it's the, I think I mentioned the 12th uh, edition of this. In the fall, we also put out a report specific to journalism and newsrooms that have emerging trends um, that are more narrowly focused. But for our purposes today, I'm going to intentionally show you adjacent trends that are slightly outside the scope of what would be in that um, annual report just for, for news and journalists. So I'm gonna start with the first of two key threats, and that has to do with new distribution systems. So in the year 1999, um, this is a small collection of all of the stuff that I was carrying around. So on your screen, you see that Nokia phone that I referenced. Um, you know, a lot of people were also carrying around really clunky, heavy laptops. I had a Toshiba, lap, uh, a Toshiba Satellite Pro that was so heavy, it doubled as a self-defense weapon. It was huge. Um, I had a mini disc player. I had a early Sony digital camera that still used floppy disks. So we're carrying all of these things around. And if you had gone back, so again, this is like two years before I had that meeting with those news publishers, uh, newspaper publishers. If, if we had all gone back to the year 1999 and said, guess what, um, within the next you know, 10 to 12 years, you're going to have all of the functionality of these devices in a single device that by the way, has more features, it has more compute power, and, and can not only do the same stuff as all of these things, but can do some others, um, you would have been skeptical. 
And if, and if I, we would have continued and said, now, within the next 20 years, you're going to have all of that compute, plus the device is going to be so small, you're going to be able to slide it into your jacket pocket or into your handbag or your pants pocket, and it's going to actually have more compute power than the computers that you are using today. You would have scoffed. And, and yet that's where we've come. So in two decades, we've gone from having all of these devices into a single device. And now something interesting has started to happen. Global smartphone sales are starting to either plateau or decline. This is not true of every single market, obviously. There are plenty of markets around the world that leapfrogged um, uh, traditional computers and tablets and things like that and went straight to mobile. But in a lot of um, mature economies, the smartphone has started to recede. And so we're not seeing the same um, rate of new adoption of devices as we, of mobile devices as we did in the past. Primarily that has to do with features and functions. So the latest and greatest, um, you know, smartphones that are out on the market, um, they're not vast improvements uh, over what was previously there and consumers, and also the devices are becoming more expensive. So people aren't rushing out to buy them. If you look at information distribution trends over the past several decades, between 1969 and 99, we saw a divergence. So we saw enormous computers that fit inside of a room become many different devices that collected information, received information, and distributed information um, along the lines of what I've just shown you. Then there was a convergence. So between 99 and 2019, the past two decades, all of those different devices um, fit into a single sort of thing. What we're starting to now see again is another divergence. And this mobile device, which all newsrooms are so fixated on for the moment, is starting to retreat and, and no longer is part of a central focal point um, that consumers are paying attention to. The reason for that is because we have all of these other peripherals coming to market. So, and again, this varies from country to country, obviously. However, in mature economies and emerged markets, um, the cell phone is a central point of contact so that all of the other devices can interact with content that's stored in the cloud um, so that they can gain uh, connectivity and, and send and receive and store information. However, that is starting to change. So between watches and fitness devices, smart, um, these are earables. So these are devices that you can put in your ears that respond to gesture and voice and, and also take some biometrics. Um, we, we have many more options and therefore consumers are not rushing out to buy brand new phones every cycle, but are instead spending their money on these other peripherals. So you also see on your screen that I've got a pair of glasses and I know that um, everybody loves to point to Google Glass as a catastrophic commercial failure. And they may have been, but let's also recall that uh, smart glasses have been in development now for two decades. And as with every other groundbreaking technology, it's usually not the first or second iteration, um, but rather the third, fourth, fifth iteration of whatever that technology is um, that eventually hits mainstream. So. If it's the case, as I'm arguing, that I believe this is the beginning of the end of smartphones um, and that the device that we are you know, constantly looking at will very, you know, will start to retreat to the background, then what is it that comes next? What I think comes next ha are smart peripherals, um, voice-based systems, uh, a reliance on cloud and biometric mining. So. Uh, let's begin by explaining what some of those things are. So uh, what we're talking about is over the next couple of years, rather than having a directional point of contact with our machines, everything around us is a computing environment, and that includes you, which means that distribution is not really omnidirectional. I'm sorry, that, that distribution is omnidirectional versus being just omnichannel, which is something that a lot of people in news like to talk about. So let's get started with peripherals. So this is a company called Magic Leap. They make smart glasses um, that rely on something called spatial computing. Now, 
Magic Leap is not commercially available, um, and the product is going to take. I, I I have a pair. I've been down to visit the the, the CEO and his executive leadership team, um, and I've spent a fair amount of time experimenting uh, with these glasses. It's gonna be a while before they're ready for prime time. What I would say though is um, that whether or not the glasses succeed commercially, they will forever change, that this system is going to forever change how we interact with the world around us because it's already starting to inspire lots of other people to shift how they um, distribute content. So Magic Leap is an example of spatial computing, and this is where um, information moves around in a sort of seamless way. Uh, machines occupy a space around us, and they are responsive to us in real time. So this, you, th th this is a set of glasses that relies both on a tiny computer that you wear, but also the cloud. It uses sensors, um, 3D capture, rendering, wearable displays, computational algorithms, and, and all of this is happening very, very fast in real time. I will say that, you know, I've, I've, been, I've looked at a lot of technology over the past, you know, 25 years, and the only other time that I got this excited about something was when I was living in Japan and, and saw an early prototype of a smartphone. Um, so, I believe this is going to start shifting um, how we relate to each other. And what you see on the screen right now, uh, you can kind of see these red, uh, what look like shields, red and white shields, um, and geometric outlines that are somewhat transparent. One of the interesting things about this system is that it can port others in. So, so you could be in an office uh, and I could connect with you anywhere else around the world. This system recognizes the, the physics um, and the constraints, the spatial constraints of where we are. Um, and I would be able to see you maybe sitting on, I'm pointing over here, there's a couch over there. Uh, but you could be sitting on the couch and you and I could be having a conversation um, you know, that felt very visceral, that made give, gave us a great sense of, of presence. And obviously the system is used for games and other things. All right, so those are smart glasses. But there are also other smart devices coming to market like smart shoes, belts, yoga pants. And these things uh, collect a baseline of your data. Um, they, they compare your data over time and nudge you into doing things better, like walking or sitting, or they nudge you into a better downward dog if, if you're doing yoga. So those are hardware peripherals. Let me now talk a little bit about voice. So, um, you know, Again, this is going to vary a bit country to country. However, in many markets, um, smart speakers are everywhere, and they're not just the kind that you see on the screen. Speaker technology is being built into many different types of devices, including microwaves. Um, one of the data-driven models that I've built that seems to be holding is that about 50% of the interactions people have in mature markets, um, those interactions uh, with computers will be with voice by the year 2021. That's significant and important because it means that Amazon, which is currently the market leader in voice technology, that Amazon is going to quickly emerge as one of the largest search engines in the world. Why? Because people are asking questions and having conversations with all of these different devices. So stop for a moment and think about your role uh, in a world in which Amazon becomes one of our predominant search providers. Um, what we're doing is we're looking for answers, we're looking for insights, we're looking for instructions, and all of the major tech companies that you see here, but there are many others, all of them have voice on their consumer and their enterprise, road, road, uh, enterprise roadmaps for 2019 and beyond, which means that Search engine optimization, which news organizations have focused on for so long, needs to evolve quickly, quickly into V, instead of SEO, VSO, voice search optimization. Um, it should become apparent to you, if it hasn't already, that we are quickly entering a post-screen era, an era in which people are receiving content without having fixed screens in their lives, which means that VSO is the new SEO and you're gonna have to very, very quickly figure out what that means for your organization. A Couple of other quick trends to point out. 
Um, one has to do with persistent recognition. So if we've got smart speakers, we have smart devices, we have cameras, we have devices that we own, devices that we come into contact that other people own, like smart cameras all around their homes. Um, we should just acknowledge that that privacy is dead. It is. Uh, and all of us are under some form of persistent recognition. This is true even in places where the GDPR is in full effect. Now, companies are working on developing new kinds of tools to mine and refine our data in ways that are implicit. So Amazon is working on an emotion recognition system. So as you speak to um, Alexa, for example, uh, it not only recognizes who you are, but all of the other things that make you who you are. So for example, uh, after taking a baseline of, of your, um, your voice, if you cough, if you sneeze, uh, you know, Amazon knows that you very likely have a cold because you don't normally cough or sneeze. If the tone of your voice is different, if the cadence is different, um, if the cadence of your speech has changed, you know, this system may know before you whether you're depressed uh, or you're in a manic phase. Maybe you've had a stroke and you don't realize it yet. Maybe you have early onset Parkinson's. There's a lot of information that can be mined without you explicitly saying any Thing or any words, which is leading to a new area of data science called behavioral biometrics. So this is where we're able to mine currently hundreds, but in the near future, thousands of different unique biometric data points for everybody. Comparing that against our, uh, our baselines, using machine learning and, and deep learning to understand things about us um, so that we then authenticate or nudge or reward or punish people. So. This is just scratching the surface, but you, sh you know, I think what we've revealed here is that we have some deep uncertainties about how and where information flows uh, today, but also going into the future, which means that you should have some deep questions. Um, for example, what does journalism look like in a post-fixed screen, screen world when we don't have people mostly relying on their mobile devices, but instead have all of these other devices and all of these other peripherals with, which are both generating information and um, distributing information. What does that look like? Uh, how does spatial computing, which is that headset, uh, the smart glasses that I showed you, how does spatial computing relate to speech um, and to privacy? For example, do the walls of an office uh, have rights to privacy? These are the kinds of things you're going to have to start asking and answering because as people wear more peripherals, they're both shedding more data um, and opening up the possibility that other people can use that data in interesting ways. How are people uh, going to look for and literally at information in the near future? Um, we have a whole bunch of questions around local country regulations. So we're already starting to see the balkanization of the internet, right? The internet has split into splinter nets. Um, so how is your organization going to cope once we have a, a really diverse and rich ecosystem of devices? Um, and what's your newsroom's data governance plan? What are the ethics around using all of this? Which platforms are you going to align with? Which big tech companies are, are you going to align with? And what are the downstream risks of those decisions? But perhaps most importantly, how are you going to make money? Uh, when we are talking about a post-screen world and most of what you've done forever has to do with people reading words on some kind of screen or paper, how are you going to make money uh, in a post-screen information environment? What does that revenue model look like? So you can't start with exact timelines or ROI because we don't we haven't done the research yet. Instead, you have to start with deep questions and recognize that the answers are going to take time, which is why you use that cone, the strategic time horizons, to address those answers as we move throughout uh, the future. All right. So really briefly, the second key threat has to do with synthetic content which is not the same thing as fake news. What we're talking about here is artificial intelligence um, and, and AI tools and services being used in a generative way to generate people, voice, text, photos, objects, you know, motions, video, you name it. 
Um, and the way that this is done is using an initial corpora or data set, uh, training algorithms on that, and then deploying systems that meet various parameters. So I wanna go back to voice for just a moment. Um, there's a company, there are many companies that, that are in this space. One is called Lyrebird. And basically if you have you know, a few paragraphs of text of somebody speaking, um, it learns very quickly how to, uh, how to, how to mimic that person's voice. Um, and it's not difficult to do. Now the other interesting thing uh, is that Google has been in this space doing all kinds of research as well. And uh, one of, the, this isn't live yet, but they've built a really interesting speech to speech translation model, which basically allows you to, again, record your voice, um, train a system, not just to recognize your specific tone, but the cadence, the beats, the unique ways that you pronounce words. Um, you train the system to learn your vocal characteristics and then it will speak like you in other foreign languages. So again, this isn't in market yet, but it's on the way. There's also some really interesting work around synthetic content in the image space. So you see three girls on the screen and just really for like two seconds, one of them is not real. I guess you see, on the, never mind on the screen, it says that the virtual model uh, is not real. She's, she's the one in the center. There's, uh, there's an entirely um, new weird world of AI influencers, people who are not people, but who have persona, uh, who, who have friends, and who live inside of Instagram and other platforms. Um, so here's an example of a model um, standing next to two real people. Um, this is a super, super popular model, uh, um, and you can see that she's, she's the one with all of the freckles. She is an AI, she's not real. Um, and she's creating content um, all over the place. So synthetic content can be both good and bad. Uh, I started experimenting um, many years ago trying to build my own digital twin. And I've had different um, versions of me um, that have kind of sort of worked over the years. I built uh, on the left-hand side, there's a chat bot that I built that I trained to have conversations about emerging technology. Um, she's a little janky. Um, on the right-hand side, that's an, a, a much truer AI version of me called Akira um, that uh, can have more general conversations um, and, and react in ways, at the moment it's all text-based, um, in an effort to build a digital twin. And the point of this is research on the one hand, and on the other hand, a way to scale me, because I can't be everywhere at once, and I know a lot of people want to have questions about deep uncertainty um, and, and to have conversations like that. The way that synthetic content is built is you've got a bunch of data, you have machine learning algorithms, and you have processors. Now, some you, you've, I've sure heard about deep fakes, and um, sometimes these two get conflated, but I wanna show you a really interesting example of a, this is a video, the sound is so-so, but this is David Beckham, and all it, synthetic content was created so that he can have a conversation about malaria in many different languages. As I play this, I want you to watch his face, which is mapping exactly to all of the different words that he's saying. The voices clearly don't sound like him. Um, we're, we're probably a year away from modulating somebody's voice so that it sounds the same, even as it, it's being used to speak in other languages. So take a quick look. Malaria isn't just any disease. It's the deadliest disease there's ever been. Se dice que ha matado más de la mitad de la población que ha existido. Dirían un tan muriquí. O a más allá la doctor lo que fila con la derriba tal. You know, so a little janky, but I also think pretty good. Now there was a famous example of uh, people scraping President Obama's face and lifting words from a present from a show that he was on in the United States called The View. So the show is on the left-hand side. What you'll see on the right-hand side is his face, and it looks very convincing. It looks like maybe it was official, and he was sitting at the White House talking. Take a look. For other people, uh, us being uh, thoughtful about other people's traditions mm -hmm. uh, is something that uh, Michelle and I try to teach our kids. You know, so there are reasons for creating video synthetic content like this. Um, 
being able to, to relate and communicate with other people uh, in a language that they understand is certainly beneficial. If you're a CEO uh, or a thought leader or a researcher, you can't be everywhere at once. Creating synthetic content is a terrific way of being able to communicate with people directly. But there's a dark side to this. So obviously impersonating um, a president is a bad thing. But this one is uh, that I'm going to show you is pretty, pretty ridiculous. Um, so in the US, uh, there was a fake video, video that was edited of Nancy Pelosi, who's our Speaker of the House, um, to make it look like she was a little drunk. And everybody demanded that the video was taken off of Instagram and YouTube. Uh, the platforms uh, refused to do that. So somebody created a deep fake video of Mark Zuckerberg um, saying pretty embarrassing things about himself to see how long it would take Facebook and Instagram to remove the video. And to, as of now, it's still live. Imagine this for a second. One man with total control of billions of people's stolen data, all their secrets, their lives, their futures. I owe it all to Spectre. So obviously they're talking about Zuckerberg himself. So just in closing, um, you know, it, it takes days when you get into a situation like this to unravel what's fake from what's real. Again, it's not always clear cut because we are already in an era of synthetic content. Sometimes that content can be quite useful. So you should have some deep questions like, you know, questions around trust are not easy to answer anymore. So what will trust and authenticity actually mean in the future? Does it mean something different to you as a newsroom executive um, than it does to somebody who's grown up with AI influencers who are all over the place on Facebook and Instagram? How does a news organization in the future maintain trust when we are in an era of synthetic content? What happens if somebody face swaps a reporter's uh, face into a crime scene? What happens if somebody manipulates your organization's photos or videos uh, in ways that change the meaning and the content? Um, what if your editors get fooled? How do you know your editors aren't gonna get fooled or that your reporters aren't gonna get fooled? And most importantly, how are you going to help everyday people understand the difference between what is real, what is actually fake, fake for a nefarious purpose, and what synthetic content that's been generated to you know, communicate in a more easy way with people. All of this ties to artificial intelligence, and here's where I'm gonna leave it. Um, there's still a tremendous amount of misplaced optimism, fear, misunderstanding about AI, and I continue to observe that um, a lot of leaders of news organizations don't quite understand the difference. Artificial intelligence is simply the third era of computing into which all of the things that I've just mentioned tie in. So now would be a really good time because AI is not the future. It's been here for a long time um, to get up to speed on what AI is, what it does and why it matters. You have to think exponentially about the future and be willing to take incremental actions all along the way, because you are facing fundamental existential risks, risks that you can, I think, mitigate in the present. I believe in what you do, I believe in you, and I believe that you have the power to build a future uh, that we all wanna live in, but you have to get started today. You have to confront uncertainty and get to action. So um, this is just to leave you with before we do the Q&A. Um, this is a Dropbox folder uh, and it's case, the link is case sensitive, but it has the report in it that I mentioned. It has all the research. It's got a ton of stuff in there and all of our research and tools are open source. So please download them, use them as you'd like, distribute them, do whatever you want with them. Uh, all right, should we now go to Q and A? Yeah, Amy, first of all, thank you so much. There's so much in there thank to digest. You. I have a bunch of questions. So first of all, thank you, Amy. That was a fantastic thank presentation. Thank you. Um, we are running slightly over, but we have a couple of microphones there. Are there any burning questions from the audience? Also, Amy, I was happy that little Michaela from LA, albeit virtual, managed to get in there. Well done. I've been following her for a while. <laughs> it's you. fascinating. Thanks. Do we have any burning questions? One just here, if we could get the microphone. If you could possibly just introduce yourself before you sure. ask the question. So we've got a, thank you. Hi there, my name is Farhan Malik and I'm from Pakistan. Hi, Amy, how are you doing? Hi, how are you? Great. 
uh, one of the most fundamental questions that we ask ourselves these days in our newsrooms is that uh, with so much happening so fast, you know, technology is evolving at a breakneck pace, but are the humans also equipped to deal with all of this at such a fast pace? Because we have seen the geopolitical uh, aftermath of such things, the change in algorithms of Google, uh, the kind of, uh, you know, nationalistic governments we are seeing all over the world. Uh, uh, two questions. Uh, how do you look at the future of technology, uh, consider looking at the uh, geopolitical changes it is bringing about in the world, and the more individual human aspect of technology, which is uh, the burnout. Would we mm -hmm. be able to sustain this? Sure. Thanks. You know, the question that you're asking, I happen to have uh, on my shelf next to me. There's a book that is still in print that was written many years ago called Future Shock by Alvin Toffler. Um, this book is, I think, 40 years old now. Uh, and, and he asked the same questions. Uh, the same questions are on burnout, um, around the rate and the pace of change. And I, and I just bring that up because it, oftentimes it feels like we're the first generation going through um, you know, such, such disruption. And, that, you know, and, and I would argue that, yeah, it's faster for us than it's been for anybody else. It doesn't mean that we can't take a critical look um, at, at what's happening, a critical data-driven look. So, um, you know, every time, so, so I'm continuously tracking change, I'm continuously confronting uncertainty, uh, and I do this using data the best that I can. Um, and my assumption is that uh, we will see patterns of acceleration, not deceleration, um, at least when it comes to tech. Now, that being said, uh, you must pay attention to geopolitics and regulation um, in, a, in a much more meaningful way than you've, than you've had to over the past 20 years. That is because, and I think this is a wildly misguided strategy, um, many governments around the world are now on the offensive and are trying to regulate the big tech companies. I, it, the big tech com companies need to be reined in, so it's not, I, I think that we need to do something, but regulatory action at this particular moment in time is not going to, it's a short-term solution to a long-term risk. While we have geopolitical changes happening in China, um, and in other places around the world in an effort to consolidate power. My concern is that technology is being used by, um, by global leaders in a way that would harm freedom of speech, that, that would go against what journalists do um, for their own political gain. I and mean, we're certainly seeing that in the US, right? And, and in other places. Uh, so, the, so this means that your job is probably more important in the year 2019 than it's been since any of in the past century. Um, you, you are our superheroes. You are the ones who are going to save the day. We need you. Um, you know, we, we really do uh, because we have a war, I think, coming, a war of information and, and distribution and technology. Amy, thank you so much. Now, we're running over, so um, we're going to have to run, but... Please join me in a big round of applause for Amy. We really appreciate that. And we'll have her slides up online later. Amy, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks, Amy. And whilst we're on the topic of regulation and talking about